But anyway, why? I love my church. Why? Um, let me just tell you this as someone who's been around a little bit, the church community, been raised in my whole life. Uh, most churches aren't worth loving. In fact, I'll just go one step further. I don't think most pastors are worth listening to. There will be a lot of services take place today in our city. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know why many of them even bother to meet because they have nothing to say and they have nothing to point to and they have no hope. And I've seen a lot of churches of our denomination and our group led by pastors who are just there. Let me give you a couple of statistics. In America, about 80% of all churches are in decline. 80%. And there's a correlating response, a statistic that goes with this. In most surveys, 70 to 80% of all pastors surveyed said if they could do something else, they would. But they're locked into it. They've been too far into it, all their education, and there's nothing else they can do. They can't make a living doing anything else but this. And we wonder why 80% of all churches are in a state of decline. Is this really what God intended? As you look across the landscape of churches today, I have to say that I don't think God had any plan for what the average American church looks like it has nothing to do with God anymore. When I was younger, we would put together model cars from Detroit. It was a big deal, classic cars. My dad was a classic car guy. And we'd put together cars. I would put the car together, and my brother who was 13 uh, months older than me, he would put one together too. And his always looked like the box was painted right. And I'll be honest with you, mine always didn't look like the box. It looked like something else. And really the difference between my brother's car and his car was the simple fact that my brother would follow every instruction by detail. He would put things together the right way. Oh, you're supposed to put the seats in at this time. I would put things together and then realize I hadn't put the seats in, have to tear it apart, put the seats back in and re-glue it. Didn't, you're supposed to, my brother would paint it ahead of time, all the little meticulous pieces, and go through and then put it, then assemble it, which is what you're supposed to do. I would get done and just take a spray of paint, go there, it's done. Look, it looks good. And the difference is this, mine was a complete mess and his was really something you'd be proud of and you'd say, look, look what I made. The difference, he followed the instructions, I didn't. And most churches look exactly like my model car. A complete mess. Just sort of improv it, winging it as you go along and putting things, well, let's try this, let's try this. You want to know when a pastor is out of ideas? They try everything. Everything new that comes down this, well, let's try this, let's try small groups, let's put a screen up there, let's do this, let's serve coffee and donuts, let's do this, let's, anything we can try and get our hands on. Why? Because they are completely out of ideas. And why are they out of ideas? They have ceased to follow the instructions that God has for the church. Churches are a mess, not because of God and not because we don't have a message to preach, not because we don't have love to share, not because as Pastor Dave sang in that great song, if you heard the part of the lyrics, that's the first time I noticed it, Dave, we are sinking in an ocean full of grace. I mean, there is grace out there. People can be forgiven of their sins. There is finally people can find true love and be known and accepted for exactly who they are. And we see a complete lack of power that takes place in the American church today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. If you have a Schofield Reference Bible, and you should, if you have a Schofield Reference Bible, it says something very interesting at the top. It says, the model church. And that's really what Thessalonians is. It's about a church that not only impacted their local area, but impacted their entire region. The Apostle Paul is writing to them. And just with me, don't, don't, I'll read out loud, you be quiet. In the first three verses is what we're going to look at. Paul and Silas... And Timotheus unto the church of Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you. We, Paul did not start all of his letters like this to every church. But I am so thankful for you. He did not say that to every church. I'm thankful you exist. But the Thessalonians, they did it right. Verse 2. Mentioning you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. I love my church today because my church loves kids. If you're taking notes, our little church chat. Yes, I grew up in the 80s, watched Saturday Night Live. Our little church chat today point is this. A healthy church has a lot of children. One of my mentors and heroes, Pastor Gregory, 
would always say anything healthy grows. Anything healthy grows. Uh, you can see that in a family. A healthy family will grow. Uh, some of our families are too healthy, but that's their choice. Uh, a healthy family grows. A healthy church can't help but grow. You find a church that is not growing, there's something wrong with it. You are healthy, sir. We, we were in Chicago, met some friends and I, that we hadn't seen in over 10 years. We went to school with them, and I'm surprised at how much weight they gained. I, I look exactly the same as I did in high school. I weigh in college. I mean, I weigh 130 pounds, just like college. And uh, I haven't changed one bit. It's such a lie. But I will never go bald. I may get fat, but I'll never go bald. You know why? We, we kind of even made a joke. And we were like, you know, somebody we saw, and I said, hey, have they gotten fat? They said, oh, yes. Mentally, I said, praise God, they're fat. And uh, they said, well, the girl said, well, I think we all have. And I said, well, it's because we're healthy. I'm not overweight. I'm healthy. And all around the world, people would look at me and go, where are you getting all this food? It's amazing. Look at you. Only in America we look at me and go, he needs to lose some pounds. I'm bending. Let me get back on track. Church chat. A healthy church has lots of children. Every child needs two things. To make a child complete needs two things. And this is why we have a lot of incomplete people running around the world. Number one, they need a family with a male and female. And number two, they need a group to give moral guidance. This is why, listen, I don't hate anybody. This is why I am not in favor of same-sex marriages. What two people want to do behind closed doors is whatever twisted, weird act you want to do, that's your business. But this is why I'm against it. Because every child needs a male and a female. Every boy needs a father. Amen? Yep. Oh, I don't believe that, Pastor Steve. All right, go to prison. I've been in enough prisons. I've talked to enough prisoners. And you will find about 90 to 95% of all the people in prison have one thing in common. It's not race. It's not background. It's not socioeconomic levels. What they have in common is most of those men do not have a father. Every boy needs a father. And every girl needs a mother. And mother to God, you need that same sex. You need that opposite sex. You need that input in there. And to say that, listen, to argue against this argues against common sense. To argue against that every boy needs a man and every girl needs a girl, every family needs a male and a father, to argue against that goes against evolution. Oh, yeah. To argue against that goes against everything we've known about society. It goes against all the facts that are laid out. To argue for that, oh, you don't need a male. And I've seen girls do this too. I don't need a man. All right, you may not need a man, but your son needs a man. I don't need a man. Why, you may not need a man, but your little girl needs a male role model, needs someone in her life, because if she doesn't, she will probably end up being like you, pregnant at 16. Every family, to argue for the opposite is nothing more than bigotry. Yeah. Look up the word bigotry. Bigotry simply means, hey, I will not accept anything other than my specific viewpoint. Everything that goes contrary to what I have decided is wrong. That's what bigotry is. To argue against the fact that every child needs a male and a female is nothing more than narrow-minded adherence to a set of ideological beliefs. Because society has shown us and proven, you can't discuss this with, we can't argue this. You will, you will not win with me. There's enough proof. You, all you have to do with this point, turn on Jerry Springer and ask yourself the question every time, is there a male and a father in these people's lives? Every child that's shot down the south side of Chicago, you know what the south side of Chicago's problem is? It's money. No, it's not race. It's not anything else. It's not the fact that they have to root for the white Sox. It might be part of it. You know what the problem on the south side of Chicago is? They don't have a male and a female in the home. You put a father and a mother in the home, and a child turns out drastically different. Now, let me get a little more personal with some of you. This will step on some of your toes. This is why I'm against divorce. The same logic I have against same-sex marriage is the same logic I'm against divorce. And I realize sometimes it has to happen. I realize sometimes people are dangerous. I realize, but you say, well, I'm not happy. Why do you get to be happy? You're married. Marriage is not about happy. Marriage is not about love. Amen? Amen. Marriage is designed to raise children. You be happy. You find love after you've raised your children. You figure it out later. But this is the same reason why, young ladies, this is why I'm against you shacking up with guys. 
Because you're just creating a cycle. This is why I'm against spring break and girls gone wild. Because all you're doing is creating a cycle. This is why I'm against Hooters restaurants. And all sorts of things that denigrate. This is why I'm against pornography. This is why I'm against because every all these things create a cycle of destruction. Young people, listen to me. I've been around enough. I've worked in enough soup kitchens. I've worked in enough uh, rescue places. I've been around enough poor people. I've been down the south side of Dallas for over a year. I've seen enough poor people, and I'll tell you what they all have in common. They all have addictions. Number one is alcohol. And they all have sex outside of marriage. You eliminate alcohol and sex outside of marriages. In America, you cannot help but end up being prosperous. Amen. You can't. It's so easy, but you have to eliminate those two things. And that's why I'm against it. And if you're here, you say, Pastor Steve, I did all of it. From this moment on, from this day forward, do it right. You've been married 20 times. All right? But from this moment on, do the right thing. You've got a sling of people. I mean, you're on some of those tapes, right? From this moment on, do the right thing. Amen? Amen. Because there is a sea of grace. A sea of grace that even though you've made mistakes, and by the way, I have made mistakes too. And even though you've made mistakes, that sea of grace can forgive you. And secondly, every child needs a moral guidance. I've had these discussions with atheists every now and then, and atheists is one of the big things. Now, don't, don't use this as an argument because you'll win, but don't use this as an argument. A, a common thing with atheism will say is, I can be moral without God. I can be moral without God. And I always reply this, yes, you can be moral today without God. But you have nothing to keep you in check for tomorrow. You have no guidelines. And you say, well, well church people have done bad things, and, and Christians and people who believe in God have done bad things, but yes, let me give you a few names. Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, Castro, Che Rivera, and a few others. They all have a few things in common. They're all big government. They're all atheists. And together, they murdered last century about 150 million people. Add the Crusades up. Add up all the Muslim terrorists that they do in the name of God. Add up all the stupid things Christians. Add up all the abortion doctors that some Christians have killed. Don't do that. And of all the bad things Christians have done, it does not equal 150 million people. Because today you can do right, but tomorrow you have no guidelines. Do you know why I? Do you know why I'm the way I am and the structure I have is because I know that today I will serve God, but tomorrow I will answer to Him. <coughs> Every person needs a mom and a dad in their home, and they need a group to give them moral guidance. That's right. You know the difference between me. And the buddies I ran with, one's in prison, yay, church kid. A couple have had some other issues in their life, addiction. The difference between me is I had a mom and dad who loved me. I was born in the third day of my life I was in church. Taught me right and wrong. My parents had seven kids. It was a struggle, but they stayed together. It wasn't a perfect marriage, but they, had, they loved each other. I didn't say that. And I had a church. I had a family that worked with my church and supported my church, and I had a church that backed up my parents, and so they said the same thing together. And at a young age, I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. Yeah. I stand before you a complete person. You can laugh at that. You're like, a complete idiot. So why do so few churches have children? Three reasons. Children will stay, and I say children, I mean young people, students, college age. I'm sorry, I'm just lumping y'all together. I got old man disease. Ah, these kids, this next generation. But children won't stay when they're not welcome. Most churches want dolls, they don't want kids. Kids are annoying. Yay, children, you're wonderful, you're awesome, you're the next generation. You're a pain. They are. Yes, amen. <laughs> children won't tolerate deadness. You know why a lot of kids aren't in churches today that have ceremony and religious and big hats and robes and everything? Because it's dead. It has nothing to offer. It is religion. I am not a religious person. I don't trust religious people. Religious people are dangerous. Don't get involved in religion. It's bad news. Religion will send you to hell. I don't want nothing to do with religion. It is dead. I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's what you need. 
Religion tells you to bow, do this, light a candle, take this class, do it all, take the pastor to lunch, give money to this person, give it to this organization, you have to do these set of rules, or God won't love you. That's not true. God will always love you no matter what you do. A relationship says, do this because I love you. And children deserve the best. Most people get saved. Listen, most people get, I'll tell you why children deserve the best. Most people get saved before the age of 18. It's just a fact. Most people do. Uh, most churches, if you go to their children's wing, and you go to their, it's a, a basement with a leaky bucket. And it looks like something out of the mission field. I've seen pictures. I was at a large church. I'm going to share this with you. Faith. And, and we were a large church at one point of a thousand people. And a missionary from Russia came. It was right after the you know, wall came down. And they were showing their church. And this is our Sunday school wing. It was in a basement. It was real dark and thing. And I went to Pastor Gregory, who I love. And I said, did you notice something about the pictures and that missionaries and that look familiar? He said, what? I said, their Sunday school looks just like our Sunday school. We've got three large, beautiful rooms for adults. But we have nothing for children. And it's a dank, dark basement, Right? And it leaks, and sometimes sewage comes back up, and that's what we have for kids. And then you're wondering why we don't have any kids in our church. We had a good relationship, but sometimes he didn't like me. Um, that's true. Young people, listen to me. We can't compete with MTV. We might not even compete with all the other churches in town, but I promise you this. What we have, you'll get the best of it. Amen? Tonight, Iwana, it's the best workers in our church will be in Iwana and be part of our ministry and take care. Some of the best people, Miss Tammy and Miss Rachel, and, and I don't know how Bill got involved in this too, but even Bill uh, are some of the best people in our church and they're leading our Iwana ministry. Why? Because children deserve the best. There's something special about kids. Jesus said, you come to faith what? As a grown adult who knows everything? No. You come to faith in Him as a little child. So, today, First Thessalonians will teach us about children and church. Number one, God can overcome our mistakes. Check this out. Some of you need to hear this, especially after I talked about uh, family structure and mistakes as a, as a young person. Look at verse one. Paul and Silas, I'm just going to say Silas, and Timotheus, which is Timothy, unto the church of Thessalonians. Okay, you read it real quick. Even if you've only had a vague reference of church, most people know the Apostle Paul, okay? Wrote 13 uh, of our 27 New Testament books. And big person, very important. There's a lot of, there's churches, and there's, there's a town in Minnesota named after, you know, Paul. It's a big name. I, my middle name is Paul, okay? Right there out of the Bible. Uh, some of you may know Silas. Silas was very important. He was a huge church leader in the, uh, the early church of Jerusalem. And he went around with Paul the second half of his missions and started all these churches. You'll see Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas. Tag team, big important part. And then you come to Timothy. Now you may know that Timothy was the pastor of the church of Ephesus. And Paul will write the book of Ephesus to Timothy. He's a young pastor. And in Ephesus, Paul sort of lays out some things. One of the things is the qualifications of a pastor and of a deacon. First qualification of a pastor is a husband of one wife. A pastor shouldn't be divorced, but I don't, I don't see how a pastor can be a woman also and, and keep that qualification. A husband of one wife. But Paul will lay this out to Timothy, a young pastor. And you may know that, but what a lot of people don't know about Timothy is that Timothy comes from a divided home. Some of you with little boys in your divorce, listen to this. This is huge because you need some hope. Uh, Timothy came from a divided home. In Acts chapter 16, 1, it says this. Then came he to Derba and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, that's Timothy, the son of a certain woman who was a Jew and believed. She was a Jewish well, first century believer. But his father was Greek, and it sort of implies that his father wasn't a believer. Then in 2 Timothy, one of the letters to Timothy that Paul writes, he says this, When I call to remembrance the unfaith faith that is in me, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, talking to Timothy, your grandmother was a believer, and thy mother Eunice, Okay, those are mother and grandmother names, right? And my mother do this. I am persuaded that thee in thee and also. He talks about the faith that Timothy's grandmother had, the, take, the faith that Timothy's father had. Timothy was raised in a divided home. His mother was a Jewish believer, and his father, it seems by all evidence, was a Greek unbeliever. Now, Timothy's home was divided by a few things. First, faith in God. It was a mixed marriage. Listen, we're going to see that God can overcome any of your mistakes, but young girls, don't marry an unbeliever. 
And by the way, don't marry an unbeliever. Don't marry a believer who's not growing. If he's not ready day one to be the father of your children and the spiritual leader of your home, well, Pastor, he's a work in progress. Well, when he finally becomes right and gets his act together, then he's good enough for you. Every girl in here is good enough. Look at me. Every girl in here is good enough to deserve a good man who loves Jesus and will be a good father to your children. Amen? Amen. All of you do. But he came from a, a mixed, divided family by faith in God. His father wasn't clear. It was a divided purpose in life. The purpose of a believer is to worship God, experience God, and to serve God. Timothy's father wanted nothing to do from that. And he came from a mixed family by the support of the ministry. It is never recorded. Dad, listen to me. It is never recorded that Timothy's dad ever encouraged him, was ever part of any part of his life or his ministry. Some speculate that they divorced. That's sort of a common theory that Timothy and his mom, that maybe his dad ran off and left him and Timothy was raised by his grandmother and mom alone. Either way, there's no support. In fact, the Apostle Paul, get this dad, somebody's going to call, your son is going to call somebody dad. The Apostle Paul looked at Timothy and repeatedly will call him his son. He is my son in the faith. And that tells me that Timothy probably looked at Paul and said, he is my father. Probably on Father's Day sent Paul the, the, the greeting card. Why? Because his dad was nowhere to be bound. Somebody's going to, your dad, your son is going to call somebody dad. Is it going to be you? Timothy came from all of this, all of these mistakes that his parents made, all of these issues. But yet, here he is. He's got two books in the Bible named after him. He's one of Paul's companions. He did great, amazing things. If you're taking notes, grace can overcome anything, but shouldn't be tempted. Look, traits of Timothy's life are this. Sensitivity, affection, loyalty, especially loyalty to Paul. Those are all, sensitivity, affection, loyalty, those are all great characteristics of what? A great woman. God used his situation, even though it was not God's plan and ideal, God still took a little boy from a single mother's home and turned him into one of the great pastors of the first century, and God used him immensely. If you're here today, you have been, especially, I made all those mistakes you talked about. You have made mistakes, you have done all this, but grace can overcome them. Amen? You are washed in a sea of grace, and God can take your little boy and do something great, even though you've made mistakes. God can take your little girl and do something great, even though you've made mistakes. God can take your life even though you've done horrible, poor choices you've made. God, from this moment on, can wash you in a sea of grace and can overcome it. But I say to you young people, listen, don't tempt His grace. Because not everybody gets dry. And not everybody cleans up their act. And not everybody ends up with a Timothy. Don't tempt God's grace. Instead of being a reclamation project, and everybody in here who's had issues will say this, will agree with me. Instead of being a reclamation project of God's grace, be a testimony to the grace of God that you can go through high school and not have sex. And you can go through college and not get high. And you can make it to an altar and, and with two people in a white dress and a white suit and say, I pledge my eternity to you. And you can make 60 years of marriage. Be a testimony to that part of God's grace. Because God's grace can overcome it, but young people, don't you dare tempt God. That's right. Because you're going to hear this, you're going, well, I can go out and do all sorts. I can get hot. I can get involved in cocaine. I can go out. And Pastor Steve said, when I turn 30, I can pray a prayer. And God will, God will forgive you. But he may not restore all the mistakes you made. Young people, don't tempt it. But every person in here who's made a mistake, Timothy, a horrible mistake was made. God overcame it. He made an amazing man of God. Number two, what I learned is all ministry is a struggle. All ministry is a struggle. I hope that last point for some of you was a point of encouragement. I hope you will never look at the name Timothy and never see it in the Bible again without seeing that God overcame because of His grace. Even though someone else made mistakes, even though someone else was not the father they were supposed to be, God, through His grace, overcame and made an amazing man. Number two, all ministries are struggle. Look back here at verse two. Look at the words. In fact, I'll put it up on the screen. Look at the words Paul described. Um, and give thanks to God always for you making mention of your prayers. And these are the words that Paul remembers the church of Thessalonians. Your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope. Work, labor, patience. Not the thing most people want to hear about. 
In fact, you start teaching this and preaching about how your work and labor and patience and that not God's just not going to make wants to make you a millionaire, right? Like they do on TV and say, God wants you to work. God wants you to have labor and love people. And by the way, some of you are a laborer. God wants you to have patience, Pastor. Yeah. And have patience. You start doing This is hard. I don't want that. I want the easy, quick fix. But look, and I'll get to another verse in Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit. You notice the trend. There, right there, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Long suffering is patience and faith. If you are a child of God and are growing, these will all be the product of your life. Children are work. Let me back up on that verse. Children are work, aren't they? Amen? If you're not working as your parent, you are raising a juvenile delinquent. It is easy to do nothing and let them run free. Go, hey, it's society's problem. Good luck. Yay. No. It is a work. Uh, children are a labor. Some of you, that's why they called it labor. It was hard, right? Don't show me you ladies hate the stories of those ladies. Oh, I just walked in the hospital and the baby fell out. Don't you just want to smack that chick? It's not easy. I've been in those rooms and men have no business being in there. Good luck, Dave. I'm done. <laughs> it's horrible. But it's labor. Why do you do it? Every mom will say this. They'll, they'll say it to your kids, but it's a complete lie. Oh, uh, when you get that baby in your arms, you don't remember the pain. Man, you just passed a watermelon. <laughs> You're going to tell me you don't remember the pain? Good Lord. I stepped up. Stepped on something, a nail in my foot. That was like 20 years ago, and I still remember the pain. Tell me, you did that. I just know my mom would say it. She had like seven kids and nine pregnant, nine, eight kids and nine pregnancies. She was always like, oh, you don't remember. It was but, but, but she would let me know. I was 42 hours of labor with you. But I thought you didn't remember the pain, Mom. But you do remember the hours of labor. But it's also patience. Uh, it's easy to rail against teenagers and, and mock them and, and because teenagers are silly. They're silly. Come on. Look at some of you. Look at some of us when we used to dress like, remember how cool it was to have a mullet? It was cool. I was cool. Stop that. But priorities. Priorities of a model church, a clear message. I hope this has been clear. That's our number one thing. Everything we do is a clear message that Jesus is Lord and you can be saved. Children are a priority of our church. Compassion. That's why we do things for senior citizens. That's why we do uh, different events. That's why we support the uh, orphanage in, in South America. We have compassion. That's why we help out at the food kitchen and, and, and give to a servant's heart because we have compassion. In community, we make an impact on our community. Those are the priorities of a church. And that is what God blesses. And that is why so many churches are not being blessed by God. And lastly, number three, what First Thessalonians teaches me is that children need models. They need role models. They need a father. And when there's not that father, they need their church family to support that mom and to be that role model and to be an impact on that child and to be a model for what faith in Christ looks like. Look at the trend that this passage is here. You notice in verse 1 what Paul says repeatedly, Father, Father, God, our Father. It can be very difficult to see a heavenly Father that you can't see. And that's why God has given us leaders and men in our church. Where our church fills in the gap. You see, your child needs a home. But they also need outside influences and moral guidance. From the time I was 0 to 19, there's about 7. Look, I went to public school. There's about seven men from zero to 19, including my dad. There's about seven amazing men who made a huge impact on my life. They made directions. They, they, they made comments into my life. When I was thinking about doing something stupid, they were like, okay, well, here, try this. And, you know, seven men, amazing men. I am here today because of these seven men. I am here. I am the man I am because of these seven men. They have guided me. I'm alive because of a few of these seven men. And you know what all seven of those men had in common? They were all, at that time, members of my home church, First Baptist of Washington. All seven of them. Your son needs a role model. I love sports. I love the Pittsburgh Steelers. I love Ben Roethlisberger because he brought me two Super Bowls. But I will say this. He's the 
poor role model for how a man is supposed to behave himself. Some of you follow sports know that. Your child, your son, your daughter, they'll take a role model. So mom, do you want Miley Cyrus to be your daughter's role model? Or would you like someone like Mary to be a role model and influence in your child's life? Do you want some basketball player who's on his fifth baby mama to be your son's role model? Or do you want a guy like Bill Herman, our water director, to be a role model that your son can look up to? Every person needs to be complete. They need a mom and dad. And some of you know that. You, 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 it, it hurts when I say it because you know what it's like because you didn't have a dad or your mom wasn't there or you're, you're missing parts. And it's, just, it's such a struggle. You know that's true. And every person needs a group of people to give guidance, to be a role model, to be an example, to, to be complete. And that is your church. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord's Prayer.